Magandang umaga po sa ating lahat. To all those joining and watching, watching now, we welcome you to the online dialogue with PESA Registered Enterprises on Vaccine Procurement. This dialogue is brought to you by the Philippine Economic Zone Authority. I am Tasneem Abdul Rauf, the OIC Division Chief of the Promotions Public Relations Group, or PPRG of PESA. I am pleased to be the MC for today's online dialogue. In behalf of PESA, I welcome our esteemed speakers, our distinguished guests, and attendees, and of course, our ever dynamic PESA Director General Chirito Ching Plaza and Deputy Director General Mr. Teresa Opanga. Now we have here five speakers to briefly introduce them to you to have an idea who will be speaking in this morning's program. We have Dr. Rizel Nika M. Howe from the, the Department of Health. We have Dr. Eudoro J. Herbosa from the National Task Force. We have Dr. Pauline Jean B. Rosel Ubial, who is the head of the Philippine Red Cross Molecular Laboratory. We have Ms. Josephine or Joaquin Romero. She is the ASEAN BAC Philippines Program Lead Senior Advisor. We also have Mr. Carlo Roach Garucho, the Chief Operating Officer of IP Biotech Incorporated. Thank you to all esteemed speakers for gracing us here virtually to discuss about a very important matter, which is the COVID-19 vaccine procurement. This online dialogue is being seen by a live stream in PESA's YouTube and Facebook accounts. I hope you follow us, subscribe to our social media accounts for um, important updates from the office. Thank you very much to PESA's proactive team, the Promotions and Public Relations Group for this online dialogue platform. To formally begin our program, let us all have a moment of silence for our invocation. So our invocation video will be played now. Our Heavenly Father, the fount of all goodness and grace, the cause of wisdom, the source of intelligence, we welcome you, O Lord, to this auspicious gathering of your beloved, who continuously give you thanks for every opportunity to learn something new and become fruitful to the works of your creation. We humbly come to you, not because we are worthy, but because we find ourselves in need of you, who is our strength and our hope, to continue despite the challenges we face in health, prosperity, and our solidarity with one another. We pray that today's gathering made possible by the grace of advancements in technology and social media, become successful in its endeavors so we can offer it back to you as our humble offering to honor you, glorify you, and love you through our deeper connection with everyone. May we find bliss in today's session and become more productive children and co-creators of the earth. This we ask and pray through Christ our Lord. Amen. Thank you very much for that invocation. To formally start our program, of course, we provide our most prayer to God to guide us. Okay, so so flashed on your screen are the rules and reminders for this online 
online dialogue for all the participants and even our speakers for an orderly online discussion. So we have here six. First, please mute your audio or microphone when you're not talking to avoid distraction and interruptions on the part of the host or the speaker. Although I believe um, this may be deactivated already for some participants. Second, put your correct or complete names uh, when you when you want to ask a question in the chat box so the host or speaker can properly identify and address you. Ensure that you are in a quiet environment so that the other virtual participants will be able to hear you clearly when you speak. Third, uh, fourth, please remember to have a decent account, may it be virtual or not, when there is a need to open your camera. I hope I have a decent background. <laughs> Please hold off your questions after the end of each presentation. You can choose to use the raise your hand button so that the speaker or host can acknowledge your queries after the talk. Lastly, you may use the chat box for further questions and queries. But uh, we will flash uh, in a while the flow of the program for this morning. Actually, there's uh, a portion every part of the program where we will entertain some very top or important questions or most frequently asked questions. Now, please flash the program flow for the participants to be guided. OK, so what are the topics that we will tackle today, this morning, with our speakers? For today's online dialogue program and agenda, it, it will be divided into program. We have two speakers from the government. We have, of course, Dr. Howe of the OH, Dr. Herbosa of the National Task Force. And then in, in the second part of the program, it's focused on the private sectors on COVID vaccination management. We have three resource speakers, Dr. Dr. Rosel Ubiel, Mr. Mero, and Mr. Rucho. A Q&A portion will be conducted each after part one and part two. So don't worry. Uh, there will be also uh, means for to entertain other questions. Uh, we will flash important uh, details of the speakers, their contact details, so that there will be direct means for ask their questions as well. And now, now, ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, I introduce to you Pezza's visionary, strong-willed, and dynamic Director General, no other than Brigadier General Chorito Ching Plaza for the opening remarks. It is a pre-recorded video, um, but um, she's very much with us in spirit and she's very supportive of this online dialogue. So please play the opening remarks of PESA Director General Plaza. Dr. Mika Hao, the head of the Department of Health Disease Prevention and Control Bureau, Dr. Chidoro Berkherbosa, the Special Advisor of the National Task Force and Executive Vice President of the University of the Philippines, Dr. Pauline Rosel Obiang, my friend, the head of the Philippine Red Cross Molecular Laboratory and our former DOH Secretary, Ms. Josephine Romero, the Senior Advisor of the ASEAN uh, Back Philippines and the Program Lead of Adoles of Hope. Mr. Carlos Garocho, the Chief Operating Officer of IP Biotech Inc. My uh, Pesan family, our uh, beloved uh, locators, investors, uh, export companies, and our Ecozone operators and everybody doing business in our economic zones. Ladies and gentlemen, a pleasant morning to all. Thanks God, I survived uh, from COVID-19 and pneumonia. Um, after 24 days ordeal at the Villuna Hospital. So I am a COVID survivor. So I welcome everyone to PESA's online dialogue on COVID vaccine procurement. 
It has been a roller coaster ride over the past few weeks as Metro Manila won or went back again to ECQ since the last week of March. And we continue to grapple with the perilous impact of the COVID-19 pandemic in our lives and in our economy. Nevertheless, PESA continues to do its best to assist its registered enterprises to continue unhampered operations. With the implementation of our uh, balancing acts to protect the safety, the jobs of our 1.6 million direct workers in our industries and our ecosystems. And uh, we were able to keep the economy afloat. Um, 87 to 95% of our uh, industries and companies in our ecosystems are now operational. Admittedly, these measures are not enough to combat COVID-19. In this view, the PESA management initiated this forum upon the request of our ecozone locators for PESA to take the lead in getting the right resource person to educate us about the matter at hand, the procurement of COVID-19 vaccines and their safety. A black swan event, COVID-19 pandemic, is new to all of us. Through this dialogue, the export industry stakeholders in PESA can all together learn and be enlightened on whether COVID vaccine is safe. What the vaccine can do and cannot do in terms of giving us protection from COVID. And how do we go about purchasing the vaccines for our respective employees? It is important to understand why it is important to achieve, to understand, and why it is important to achieve herd immunity or that majority of our population is vaccinated. The lesson is we all share each other's safety and health. Thank you to all our audience now who share with us this goal to promote health and safety in our episodes. In this online dialogue today, the first part will cover the government COVID-19 vaccination program, wherein we have speakers from the IATF and DOH. In the second part, the topic is the private sector vaccination management. We have speakers who are potential suppliers of the vaccine from the private sector, initially for this first dialogue with your teachers. We have the Philippine Red Cross. We also have the Go Negotio, which are NGO partners of PESA in the conduct of COVID testing and contact tracing in the ecosystems, and with whom we are also pursuing a memorandum of agreement with for our ecosystem vaccination program. Another supplier is IP Biotech, which is the first entity and so with Medicare to have submitted a proposal to PESA for the COVID vaccination of our employees. PESA's role in this exercise of vaccine procurement is more of an enabler. We can help facilitate the locator's purchase of vaccines on a per episode basis for ease of administration and subject to strict compliance with COVID vaccination protocols. However, we wish to emphasize that the locators are free to choose their own suppliers and administrator of the vaccines, and that they will not be obliged to donate when they purchase the vaccines through this PESA Ecozone vaccination program. On a voluntary basis, locators may donate vaccines 
as a corporate social responsibility, a CSR project, but this expense will not be covered in PESAS uh, and BIRs approved allowable deductions under the 5% GIE incentive. PESA is not a position to subsidize the cost or advance payment of the vaccinations for and in behalf of the locators. Pursuant to PESA's 10-point program or transformation roadmap with the goal of making the Philippines as an investment haven in Asia. So we need to see to it that we continue to keep our economic zones COVID-free, safe, healthy, and sustainable. We urge our ecozone locators and their workers as our economic frontliners to remain resilient and strong so we can keep the economy afloat amid the COVID threats. We hope that this event will result to a fruitful discussion and soon the successful acquisition of COVID vaccines to ensure the safety of our family. Let us continue to do our best to become part of the solution and help our country to rise from this pandemic stronger than ever. With PESA's worldview, thinking global and acting local, we want to contribute in the global supply chain and the continuation of our economic trade and partnerships with other countries. And we will be acting local by addressing the protection of the health, the protection of the jobs, and the protection of the Philippine home. So once again, I thank you for joining us in this dialogue. Galing Pinas, Galing Pinas. Always stay safe, everyone. Mabubay po tayo. Thank you very much for that opening remarks, PESA Director General Ching Plaza, that give the audience the purpose and goals of this online dialogue on COVID-19 vaccine procurement and PESA's overall thrust of its programs amidst the pandemic. So you've heard our Director General about the PESA's balancing act and the COVID-19 measures in its echo zones. Moving forward, let us now start the first part of the program about the government COVID vaccination program. Let us welcome our first speaker. So she is the head of the Department of Health on Disease Prevention and Control Bureau for Policy and Planning, COVID-19 and COVID-19 vaccines. She leads the technical oversight over COVID-19 and vaccination program policies and plans, including integration standards for disease prevention and control for universal health care. She was designated as deputy to the COVID-19 surveillance and quick action unit and acted as lead secretary of the Interagency Task Force, or IATF, for Emerging and Infectious Disease Subtechnical Working Group on Data Analytics, providing policy recommendations on the national response for COVID-19. Her topic is DOH on the National Vaccine Deployment Plan. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Razel Nika M. Howe, MBA MSc. Good morning, ma'am. Hi, good morning. Um, and thank you for giving us the opportunity to provide you an overview um, of the National Vaccine and Deployment. So uh, what I will go through very briefly is um, just a snapshot of uh, what to expect uh, when we will be conducting and you will be conducting um, vaccine uh, vaccination within your respective area. So uh, just for everyone's um, and frame of thinking, our national vaccine deployment plan is really a whole of government and whole of system and whole of society in its approach. It encompasses uh, stakeholders not only of the government, but also of the private sector uh, and even our non-government organizations. 
So there's a series of events that have to take place um, before the vaccination program can happen. And this is summarized in this slide in these seven steps. The first is the scientific evaluation and selection of the vaccines uh, that will be available in the country. Uh, second, we would be the access and the acquisition. Uh, then it will be procured and financed. Um, and then it will be uh, shipped and stored within our uh, supply chain management um, offices. Uh, the next step would be distributed before the actual implementation in nationwide vaccination. And even after vaccination, our work doesn't stop. Uh, and we have to go through the process of regular assessment, monitoring, and evaluation, especially of the uh, vaccine recipients if they have experienced any adverse event uh, following. So, reference to everyone, the vaccination um, organizational cluster is part of the whole. Um, um, organizational structure of the national government for the COVID-19 response. So the overall lead of the response is our interagency task force uh, for the management of emerging diseases. And this is actually made up of all of the secretaries uh, of our national government agencies, and they are in charge of all of the policy directions uh, across the country. We have three main clusters in all of this response. So one is the um, regular response for COVID, which encompasses prevention, detection, isolation, uh, treatment, and recovery. And we actually have another cluster also on uh, recovery or in opening the economy. So this vaccination program is also one uh, group on its own. It's called the Vaccine Cluster, and it is headed by uh, Secretary Carlito Galvez. Uh, and we have the specific task groups within them that takes uh, uh, lead to all of the specific acts that I mentioned in our class earlier. So the, the different tasks are on um, vaccine evaluation and selection, which is headed by Department of Science and Technology, uh, the task group of diplomatic engagement and negotiation, which is headed by uh, the Department of Finance, uh, with the task group of uh, procurement and finance. And then our task, task group on cold chain and logistics management, uh, along with the task group on the immunization program headed by the Department of Health uh, and a task group of demand generations headed by uh, both the Department of Health and the PCA. So as of this time, we have four vaccines that already have emergency use authorization in the country. This includes Pfizer, AstraZeneca, uh, Sinovac, and the Malaya Sputnik. Uh, as you have seen in many media engagements of Secretary Galvez, uh, we are having a portfolio of vaccines and we are, all, we are also looking to uh, having the authorizations for other vaccines in the portfolio, including Janssen, Johnson & Johnson, uh, Novavax, and Moderna in the near future. So the whole process of um, accessing uh, and acquiring these vaccines I will be discussed later by our next panelist, uh, but briefly it will encompass all of the steps of having uh, non-disclosure agreements, term sheets, and supply agreements with the different stakeholders. And uh, just for, for reference of everyone in the group, we have many modes for procurement and for, for financing. So we, have, we are a member of the COVAX initiative, which is a global initiative pooling the demand, especially of developing countries. And, and we also have some government to government um, relationships about our supplies and our multilateral and tripartite agreements. So, specifics of this will be mentioned in the uh, succeeding presentation. Uh, what I'm showing you here is uh, what we are referring to as the national prioritization framework. So globally, and even in our country, in the context of uh, limited supply, we will have to determine who would be the first groups of people uh, who will be eligible to receive the vaccines that are available in the country. So all of our vaccines right now actually um, have evidence against reducing death and reducing severe disease. So that's why the... Uh, top priority groups that were chosen are those that have uh, the most benefit to reducing severe disease and death. And that actually includes 
uh, priority A1, which are our frontline health workers uh, in the health facilities. Uh, and then uh, the second po yung ating mga senior citizens and those adults with uh, disease conditions or comorbidities uh, that will need to have that protection. So at this point in time, we are already having our simultaneous vaccination to priority groups A1, A2, and A3 through our local government units. And in the succeeding months, we will be going into the next priority groups, groups uh, such as priority group A4, which is the frontline personnel in essential sectors, uh, which was endorsed and developed by the recovery cluster uh, through NEDA. No? And then A5 would be our poor population. Uh, and then the rest of priority B, as I mentioned here, the teachers, the social workers, other government workers, other essential workers, those that are at um, significantly higher risk na social demographic groups, uh, and then the other remaining workforce and the rest of the labor. So just to give you um, some more information of priority groups A2 and A3, especially if you want to be vaccinated at this point in time, uh, for everyone that's age 60 and above, we will start with the senior citizens that belong to institutions and then all of the other senior citizens. And for those who have uh, some disease conditions, uh, as long as it is controlled and that they can show any proof, of your condition, uh, you can be eligible to group A3. You know? So these groups can in in include a medical certificate, prescriptions, hospital records, surgical records, or any other proof of your comorbidity. So I just summarized uh, some of the example conditions of those who will belong to priority group A3. I will not go through each and every one of them. Um, but as long as it's in the general categories of chronic respiratory disease and infection, cardiovascular disease, chronic disease, cerebrovascular cancer, diabetes, obesity, uh, neurologic, uh, chronic liver, and immunodeficiency states, uh, these are the types of people that are part of priority group A, which would be part of the vaccination program. So just to uh, make it clear din po, no, na, uh, all of the, the disease conditions I mentioned earlier do not actually need to have medical clearance prior to vaccination, except if they fulfill any of the six conditions that are mentioned at the top of the screen. No? So they will only need medical clearance if they have autoimmune disease, um, if they have HIV, especially if they're undergoing therapy, if they have cancer, if they are taking immunosuppressive drugs, transplant patients undergoing steroid treatment, and other patients with beer prognosis or are um, bedridden. So this medical clearance process is to have a risk and benefit assessment of each individual patient. Uh, and can be done, in, um, and this could be uh, outside the health facility, you know, like in other um, open areas, provided that they have networks with uh, healthcare facilities uh, and healthcare provider networks, especially for management of um, adverse events. You can also be vaccinated in specific uh, hubs, such as HIV treatment hubs, TV centers, or even at home uh, through house to house vaccination campaigns, especially if the eligible groups are uh, bedridden and they have the uh, medical. And our local governments are also uh, encouraged to have uh, facilitated transportation uh, for all of the vaccine recipients, of course, in compliance with all of our minimum public health standards. So when uh, the actual vaccination will take place, there will be a series of activities uh, that have to be done. And it will start with the pre-implementation activities of master listing, micro-planning, and mapping. So these steps actually includes establishing or create coordination with the local government unit and the local vaccine operation center, uh, the identification of the vaccination sites, uh, and the simulation, the simulation before a vaccination site could be designated and certified. Uh, especially in relation to the necessary cold chain and logistics that have to be put in place uh, for the specific vaccine. And then before the actual vaccination day, of course, 
the recipients have to be master listed, they have to be scheduled, and the actual allocation of vaccines to that specific site uh, for that specific thing. And during implementation uh, and after implementation, the, um, the surveillance or the monitoring of all of adverse events is actually until one year um, after the actual vaccination. So during the actual vaccination, uh, the usual process is that there's registration, there's health screening, uh, there's health education before the actual vaccination, and there's a recommended time period for monitoring for any adverse event um, following an invitation. I just want to take note that uh, we actually have specific guidelines depending on the vaccines because each vaccine will have their own uh, precautions, will have their own handling protocols, storage protocols, uh, and even processes for administering um, the vaccine. Uh, but to make it easier for our implementers, many of these are already available as templates and they are also available as vaccine specific templates, especially uh, some details regarding the emergency use uh, authorization, the health screening form, the informed consent form, uh, the vaccination card and the post vaccination reminder. So uh, this is just something we want to highlight for to everyone that has been vaccinated and is planning to create their vaccination sites, uh, that it should be clearly communicated with all of the vaccine recipients that all, even though they have been vaccinated, they still need to continuously implement uh, minimum public health standards after vaccination, especially the wearing of face masks and shields, maintaining distance, and hygiene, I am seeking consult and immediate isolation if they are exposed uh, or if they have symptoms. Uh, there also has to be mechanisms to remind our recipients of their second dose uh, and a mechanism to report any of the adverse event um, after immunization. So it's usually the duty of the vaccination site uh, or the local government unit wherein they are referred to uh, to have this reportorial requirement for um, adverse events. Uh, there's also some guidance about initial treatment for management of common adverse events and uh, the having of a um, trunk line or a contact um, detail no, for consultations and for uh, referrals. So at this stage of the vaccination program, we're in, we are wanting to improve the speed and the scale of implementation. Uh, some of the good practices that uh, we are recommending uh, include tapping all of the available support, whether that be from the private sector, the military, or the other national government agencies. Uh, having larger vaccination sites uh, for efficiency gains, and of course to reduce uh, the possibility of uh, mass gatherings and transmission and super spreader events uh, because of the vaccination program. Uh, we also want to highlight the use of other non-health staff to perform functions, uh, especially the administrative functions of the vaccination program, so that our healthcare workers can focus on uh, case management and the actual adverse event management for the vaccination program. Uh, we also want to lessen all of the on-site processes by finishing most of the documents, the screening, uh, and all of the processes before the vaccination day, especially if we can utilize uh, business processes to improve the speed and scale, uh, such as uh, marketing, organization, power management, and other ICT. And at the level of uh, policy, especially in the Department of Health, we're continuously um, looking at the implementation and looking at possible barriers to vaccination. Uh, and uh, we have been updating our guidelines to ensure that there will be uh, no additional barriers to all of the people who want and will need to be uh, vaccinated. So uh, I believe this is my last slide. I just wanted to reiterate that uh, the, uh, the COVID-19 vaccination is an essential strategy uh, for our country to uh, mitigate the effects of uh, COVID-19. You know? uh, but uh, we want to reiterate that it's one of the different strategies we have to take note. We have to uh, make sure that we still implement our strategies for prevention, detection, isolation, treatment, and recovery. 
especially our minimum public health standards, including our engineering controls, our administrative controls, and our um, PPEs like masks and shields, and our public health measures. So uh, this is uh, where you can find all of the references about the vaccination program. And I hope that uh, this few minutes spent today is has provided you an overview of what to expect in its implementation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. How, Dr. Razel Nika M. How of the Department of Health. She discussed DOH on the National Vaccine Deployment. Don't worry for our audience. Uh, the materials, the PowerPoint or slides will be available uh, from the speakers. If you fill up the evaluation form or there will be a form that link that will be provided at the end of this dialogue so that you can access and fill up so that when you fill it up, you will be able to access all the materials from our speakers. Now, um, Dr. Hao, uh, I hope uh, you'll join us more uh, in this dialogue because there will be a Q&A uh, after the first part, uh, after the discussion of Dr. Uh, her boss, her boss. Uh, thank you again, uh, Dr. Hao. Next in our program is our second speaker from the government. He is the special advisor from the National Task Force or NTF. He has extensive experience in trauma surgery and emergency medicine. He was under secretary of the Department of Health from 2010 to 2015 where he achieved the department's objective of implementing universal health coverage. He was also the coordinator of foreign medical teams during, during Typhoon Haiyan in 2013. At the University of the Philippines, he started the fellowship program for trauma and residency program in emergency medicine. He served as chairman of the Physicians for Peace Philippines. Ladies and gentlemen, let us welcome Dr. and Executive Vice President Teodoro J. Herbosa, and the FPCS, FPCEP. Good morning, Dr. Herbosa. Good morning. Uh, good morning, everyone, and thank you to Director General Pata for the invitation, the PESA people, and the people listening. I don't think my slides are showing, is it? Ah, there it is. Okay, so thank you very much. Share your screen. Okay. Share. Oh, doesn't want it to appear. So there's this big box in front of me. Thank you very much, Dr. Nika <clears> How <throat> for describing the, the Department of Health's very important role in terms of uh, implementing the national government's uh, the national government's uh, deployment program. You can, you can see it's actually a very complex immunization for individuals. It's just a jab, a single injection, but it becomes more complex as you look at the scale and all the operations that are required to actually de procure, deploy, and uh, evaluate, monitor, evaluate the vaccines. So can you have the next slide, please? Thank you. So I'd like to cover in the next 15 minutes the background of uh, what we're trying to do, which is really the roadmap put in. Uh, of course, uh, my boss, the general, calls it the Trinity of War. I call it the tripartite agreement. We're in the national government. The uh, vaccine companies and the private sector actually partner to be able to deliver the vaccines to the people. I'll discuss and focus on the public-private sector partnership and just give you an idea that the, that the public-private sector partnership did not start with the vaccine procurement and the vaccine deployment. And I'll discuss a little bit about the IRR. This is the Implementing Rules and Regulation of our COVID-19 Vaccination Act. And this is the Joint Administrative Order of the DOH and the National Fast Task Force, uh, labeled the 2021-1. Next slide, please. So the President's guidance to the National Task Force and the IATF is equitable access for the all Filipinos, for all vaccines to be available. And that's why you saw in the previous presentation that we have a portfolio approach because there is a, a fight for vaccines in a global shortage. Next slide, please. So the vision really is to recover our economy and the targets about 2023. Uh, we want to establish a sustainable and integrated vaccine deployment immunization program with a whole of nation and whole of society approach. This is the largest vaccination program 
this government or this world has actually ever endeavored to 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 to, to do. <clears throat> so we want to have and be able to protect the public, lower our morbidity and mortality from COVID-19. Next slide, please. So as of late, two days ago, we reported 10,000 new cases in the whole country. I think yesterday was only 9,000, so that's good news. But over on the right, you see the increase of our var variants. From the UP Philippine Genome Center, we have the biosurveillance report of uh, 752 samples, and we see that the great majority of the, this is the uh, South African variant, the B1.351, followed by the B117, which is the UK variant, and surprisingly, a, re, a variant from Region 7 uh, in the Cebu area called the P.3. Next slide, please. So there are several considerations to be able to implement a vaccine program. We needed to evaluate it, and that started as early as July last year when the initial uh, reports of vaccine trials were being done. We created a vaccine expert panel that already tried to study the the, the different candidate vaccines. And then we are at this phase in the middle, which is the, the, the selection process, the approvals by our FDA, the production and shipment, procurement, and then the deployment. And you saw that uh, accurately described by my colleague uh, Nika to how its complexity in terms of being able to deploy uh, about 140 million doses of vaccine to the Filipinos. And of course, the end state is really to be able to recover with an immunization program. And you just heard in the news, it might take uh, another booster in the subsequent years to be able to protect the people as well. Next slide. So it's been a recalibrating plan. Uh, we really have to understand how to deliver this. Uh, very important was uh, to contain the pandemic and then be able to mobilize our LGU and private partners and then be able to have a nice Christmas by 2021. Uh, by 2022, which is an election year and that complicates our matters, we, have, we plan to have an elimination of COVID-19 able to have uh, increased participation of the private sector to continue giving vaccinations and boosters to our citizens. And of course, a self-sufficiency for the next pandemic, meaning basic, basically strengthening our health security in the Philippines. Next slide. Uh, for your information, the private sector has been uh, actively, very actively partnering with government since the beginning of this pandemic. This is T3. And not everyone is listed, logo is listed here, but just suffice it to say that we've had a tremendous amount of help from the time we started uh, testing to the delivery of uh, PEs, uh, to the creation of uh, facilities, health facilities, additional health facilities. The private sector has been there from the very beginning. But the private sector isn't joining only during the time of the vaccination. They have been our partner, and it's a big group called T3, for uh, short for test, trace and treat, which is the main strategy of our fight against the pandemic. Next slide. And there are the key players of where we are. Uh, we have consulting groups that actually help us out. Uh, uh, they, they volunteer. The Boston Consulting Group has helped us in the vaccine deployment program. And this is the structure. Uh, you saw the structure of the vaccine cluster. It's had by Secretary Galvez, but ably run by the head of allocation and administration and site mobilization under Secretary Mirna Kabutahe of the Department of Health. And uh, for logistics, it's uh, under Secretary Carolina Taino. And for communications, we have uh, Ramon. Uh, and then the private sector continues to help us out in terms of this deployment. Next slide. So we want better decisions. We want faster deployment. We want to save lives and we want earlier return to normalcy. Everybody wants that. The government wants this. The private sector wants this. Next slide. So what are the key ways in which the private sector can support the government? So the mix of public and private sector to mobilize the vaccination effort is very clear. And we also want to bring global experts to help us with benchmarking on how we deploy vaccines in a country and watching how the U.S., the European nations, even countries like India, huge countries like India, implement it. And we want to identify issues or challenges, like, for example, master listings of the people that need to be vaccinated, IT administration 
and the process or the design process or the systems to put in place and the role of our private healthcare professionals. And then we also want to look at the, uh, the pace because if we vaccinate very slowly, well, we will all be killed by the COVID-19 first. So we need to vaccinate as many people as fast as possible to attain the so-called herd immunity. Next slide. So the, the, the BCG or the consulting group has helped us in the private sector, has helped us in a lot of things. First one, it highlighted the issues of what we call distribution and supply shortages. 80% uh, of the global global supply of vaccines have been cornered by the first world market because they want to protect their, their countries as well first. So we, the rest of the low and middle income countries are fighting for 20% of the remaining vaccines out in the market. And that's why we had to create a strategy that would address that. Uh, we need to talk about communications and the public uptake. We are coming from what we call the Dengvaksha hesitancy because of uh, some bruhaha of the past administration in terms of uh, deploying a new novel vaccine called Dengvaksha. Uh, which uh, caused a lot of deaths. And then we have uh, all the other efforts that need to help the, the help of the private sector to be able to deploy and plan how, how to roll out vaccines. Next slide. So we learn a lot also from mistakes because it's mistakes that give us experience. It's experience that gives us knowledge. So we're looking at how India has operationalized it as a large country. We looked at the IT systems and data processes that are needed to master lists, to counter check, to create dashboards. We saw complaints about the pre-registration in online and uh, we heard Mayor Belmonte say she's stopping her online registration because a lot of people who do not have access to uh, digital technology, especially the elderly, are uh, disenfranchised or not reach so she should she's going on a barangay per barangay level approach to actually get those that need to be prioritized prioritized next slide so there there are bottlenecks in each implementation it's a very complex people think immunization or vaccination is a simple process i i, I think those of you who are in systems and those of you who are in big corporations really know how difficult it is to bring, let's say, a bottle or a can of soft drinks to the hand of the consumer. And it takes so many steps from production all the way to the delivery itself. So these are things we need. We need a very good, correct process flow. Uh, we, need, we need to redesign, keep redesigning re-administration. Uh, we, we now open some mega uh, vaccination centers at the University of the Philippines, at the SM Aura, and several others which can be models for better ways to vaccinate people rather than in public schools or public quadrangles. We have guidelines for private sector, which I will discuss more in detail. And we are now going to have more uh, tracking of all the vaccines through the use of uh, IT or information systems technology. Next slide. So these are our partners and let me run through what each one is trying to do in four different areas of procurement distribution administration, communication, and data management. Uh, next slide. So in procurement, which is the main issue of the talk, next slide. Basically, uh, there is limited global supply for 2021. The global need is about 7.8 billion people that needs vaccination. Uh, the, the total uh, manufacturing capacity is is only 5.8 so you can understand there is a 2 billion vaccine shortfall and because of this the government decided to approach this to get a seat in the negotiating table and secure more vaccines through a what we call portfolio approach that means we talk to many vaccine suppliers and not dependent on one or two vaccine companies next slide uh, we are the first in the world actually to innovate uh, when we were discussing with astrazeneca which wanted a social entrepreneurship model of business, wherein they, they didn't want to profit so much, they just want to recover the cost of development, research, R&D, and production of their vaccines because they wanted to help. Uh, they were surprised that the private sector, as early as November, wanted to buy 
like, since they thought their market was only national governments. But when uh, the private sector group with the Go Negotio group uh, leading it uh, said they wanted to buy 2.5 million and play, place an order and put their money where their mouth is, it started uh, rolling stuff. And then the LGUs actually started saying, we have money too, we want to buy vaccines. And this created the model of what we call now the tripartite agreements. Next slide. So this was the signing of the tripartite agreement in November. Uh, the latest one is the one with the group of Razon with uh, Moderna. And of course, the other groups that are also signing, like the uh, uh, another uh, group of uh, AstraZeneca plus the no Novavax vaccine from uh, the Serum Institute of India. Next. So, so what happens in the tripartite? In the tripartite, in the beginning, Astra, Astra, not the government, Ask Go Negotio to donate 50% of what they were going to buy to the public sector. That was good for us. Of course, the government will say yes. And uh, luckily, Go Negotio said yes. For the latter agreements, uh, LGU, there was no donation because it's still government funds anyway and would go straight to the people. But for the latter, it was no longer as high because it was dependent on what the uh, private sector could allocate and what the uh, uh, company wanted. So this is our. Uh, uh, game plan for the procurement. We've actually, what you can see is that the AstraZeneca procurement, the 17 million doses. Uh, initially, we procured three, 3 million or 2.5 million from the companies that joined the Go Negotio group. And the LG youth uh, jumped in and bought another 10.6 million doses. So, with that alone, we actually uh, reached the quota, the Philippine quota for AstraZeneca which is 17 million or about 20% of our population. So you see these companies are also allocating per country what they are willing to sell. So uh, So we had to go to the other vaccine suppliers. And you see now that Moderna, uh, the private sector, is buying 7 million doses and the national government is buying 13 million doses. For Sinovac, we were able to get uh, 25 million doses for Sinovac. And uh, the this that are now available and readily being delivered to everyone. And so we have uh, seven vaccine manufacturers, Novavax, Moderna, Astra. Pfizer is due to deliver on April 20. Oh no, it's Sinovac is due to deliver on April 22. Another 500,000 doses will be arriving. But Pfizer is uh, due to deliver as well through the COVAX facility. Next slide. So the private sector also helped us out in making sure that people want to be vaccinated. Uh, it's going to be a failure if we have the vaccines and nobody wants to be vaccinated. Next slide. So in the field of communications where the private sector has more expertise, they have uh, partnered with us and there is the Ingat Angat Bakuna Lahat program. So you have the uh, Be the Solution Rest Bakuna effort of the Department of Health. And in the private sector, we have the Ingat Angat. Uh, and you saw this Ingat Angat last year around Christmas when you saw all the different ads uh, companies in one advertisement. It was a, a very empowering ad of about solidarity and buy and yeah. Next slide. So the private sector will be doing the same, offering all its expertise in uh, terms of create, create, create creatives, the media agencies, the PR agencies, the analytic partners and the uh, mainstream media uh, partners as well to promote vaccination for everybody. Next slide. So these are some of our sponsors. That means they put out their own money to make sure that the vaccination campaign is disseminated to everyone. I've seen the post videos. They're actually excellent videos. Very similar in the light of the previous Ingat Angat uh, program last de December. Next slide. So we partner also with the professional agency, the Philippine Medical Association, for really making sure that everybody will get vaccinated. Next slide. So these are the uh, uh, communication imperatives, building confidence on vaccines and the government so that everybody will uh, get vaccinated. There's a lot of myths and a lot of uh, fake news circulating on social media, Viber, WhatsApp, uh, that are even, uh, uh, you know, being replacing vaccines with other oral tablets that you need to take. 
from just having the vaccine. So, so we need to fight against all of this. We want to sustain that momentum, especially when adverse events come up, a neighbor gets sick or hospitalized or, God forbid, dies from uh, after a vaccination. Uh, people become hesitant again, so we need to sustain momentum and we need to also ensure completion of the target, which is 70% of our vaccine targets. Next slide. So this is the Gantt chart of where we want to uh, do on communications. And you can see all throughout in the center is the anti-fake news digital content. This is the problem with social media. We now have faster news but the fake news travels really much, much faster. Next slide. So these are some of the sample campaign materials of the availability of the vaccines and the people wanting to get vaccinated. So it's a, a real uh, ad campaign. Next slide. So it, they even put up, of course, the communication platform of the youth, which is your Instagram and all the other platforms. I'm sure there will be TikTok as well. and All the other celebrities will be joining in to help uh, convince people to get vaccinated. Next slide. So here are some of the ideas on how to, to fight the fake news with the bakuna busters. Hindi nakakabaog ang bakuna. Walang COVID-19 virus ang bakuna. Na hindi minamadali ang pagbabakuna. Next slide. And of course, the bakuna benefits. Uh, we uh, let people get uh, their vaccination again, uh, be able to un understand the benefits of being vaccinated. Next slide. So on distribution and administration, uh, this is the big part where uh, we get the vaccines arriving, but we need to vaccinate everybody really fast. Next Next slide, please. So we have partnered with lots of people in the cold chain and storage and the delivery. So those are ultra low cold freezers. We partnered with the private healthcare companies so that they can help the deploy the vaccines as well, especially with the uh, when the uh, Pfizer vaccines come in, most of the ultra low freezers are located in some of the private hospitals. Next slide. I think this is uh, applicable for Moderna. Next slide. So they, they need to augment, our private sector needs to augment us in terms of helping out, out in increasing the efficiency of our vaccination program. So you can see we can we will need a lot of uh, jabs per day if we want to reach the desired level of uh, vaccination and the number of vaccines by the end of 2021. Next slide. And data management is very important as well. How do we know where we are? What are the dashboards? Next slide. So these are the two companies that have been uh, de deploying their uh, IT systems for vaccine administration. So they're helping out in pre-registration, in pre uh, monitoring the logistics and supply and who gets vaccinated, and then issuing the vaccine cards and tracking all people that have been vaccinated, including adverse events. Next slide. So these are dashboards that the DOH will be uh, implementing so that we can follow who are getting vaccinated. Next slide. And this is the most important uh, reading material for all of us in the private sector. This is the implementing rules and regulation of the Act uh, Establishing Coronavirus Disease 2019 Vaccination Program. So this is the, the Joint Administrative Order or JAO of both the Na Department of Health and the National Task Force. And it elucidates all the uh, efforts that are found in the law. So we created a law on vaccination for COVID-19 and we funded it, but this is the IRR. And this is downloadable from the website. I think uh, Dr. Rahao actually showed you some of the links to get this uh, downloaded. Next slide. And what is most important is section seven. On section seven is procurement of the uh, vaccine and letter C of that is procurement and administration of uh, COVID-19 vaccines by the private entities and it lists all the things that the private sector does. In summary, what it does is uh, it allows the private sector, as the president said, to procure but in uh, 
in collusion with the national government. So the national government has to allow the private group to actually acquire the vaccines and they must follow the national vaccine deployment strategy. So that means in terms of issuances of a card, prioritization that uh, Dr. Rahao described earlier, they must all be followed. So the A1 to A4, the B category and priorities will have to be followed. Next slide. So these are some, some pictures of what I recently visited. This is the SM Aura in Taguig City, and it's the Samsung Hall. So it's an events place, but it has been converted to a mega vaccination center. And when I was there, I found it very convenient. It was air conditioned. There was plenty of space, so there is no crowding. People, I saw elderly with wheelchairs who could go up through the elevator. So very convenient because even for disabled, it was okay. Uh, they had IT in place. The Taguig people had IT in place for registration. That's that's Mayor Cayetano. And he also showed us a vaccination bus that will actually go around the barangays that they can be able to vaccinate. So inside the bus, it's divided into different parts, the registration, the vaccination, and the observation area. Next slide. So I'll end with some quotes that's very important for all of us. Uh, the government at ang private sector partners, ang mga volunteers, ay marami na pong nagawa, which is what I said in the talk. Marami pong kailangan pang gawin, totoo yun, we still need to do a lot. And all the sectors ay kailangan mag-unite at tumulong sa ating pamahalaan para mahinto na ang pandemic na ito. Next slide, please. Another quote from my good friend, Jonas, who's a survivor, Dr. Jonas Del Rosario, is the spokesperson at the Philippine General Hospital. And he is a survivor. Both his parents died of COVID last year. And he said, the vaccine that is the best is the one that is in your arm and it's available. Because the problem really is, it's not only when, when do we get the vaccine. There's a race. We're getting these variants now and we really have to be vaccinated. And what he states is true. If we don't stop transmission, the variants will continue to happen and we will never get out of this rut of epidemics. Next slide. A last quote from what I said on Twitter and uh, eventually created into a meme by the National Task. We are in a war and the virus is our enemy. We are not at war with each other. Uh, this is a snipe at the the critics and the politics, polit political <laughs> attacks on what the national government is doing. Next slide. In the end, next slide, please. In the end, I'd like to say that uh, what is important is uh, well, we are not safe until everyone is safe. And uh, we need solidarity. Walang maiiwan kung walang iiwanan. Maraming salamat po and thank you for listening. Thank you very much for that substantial presentation on vaccine procurement, Dr. and Executive Vice President Herbosa. So he discussed to us the vaccine procurement and, and the, also, mentioned also mentioned the amendment and regulations, regulations on procurement. And now we move on in our program to the first Q&A portion, focusing on the government vaccination program. So our online attendees or participants here, of course, have many questions. We have more than 600 or or maybe reach a thousand of audiences here nationwide. Perhaps, of course, Luzon besides me now. And but uh, we have limited time to entertain so many questions. But of course, we have collated the top or most frequently asked questions for our speakers. Um, and again, I reiterate that for other questions that may not be entertained, uh, questions may be sent to our speakers directly to their email ads which we will flash later on at the end of this dialogue. And um, of course, we have requested from our speakers their slides so that our participants, our audience can access them. But again, a reminder, uh, you can access the slides or the res uh, resources when you fill up the evaluation form for this online dialogue. So we are now open for our Q&A. So we, have, we will flash the top questions for our government uh, experts on the vaccine procurement. We have top five questions, ma'am, sir, Dr. How and Dr. Herbosa. Uh, please bear with us. Uh, at least these are the top five questions that I believe uh, that should be uh, discussed here in our online dialogue. 
uh, you may ask uh, answer this briefly or uh, also recommend uh, references for in-depth understanding and for addressing these questions. So let me just re read them to you. And ma'am, sir, you may agree and who, who will answer between the two of you. You may both answer the questions. First is that what are the proper step-by-step -step process on vaccine procurement? storage and administration because of course procurement is just one stage and storage and administration is another task in this um, vaccination as well as in terms of quantity cost lead time vaccine brands payment plan for smes second is is there a template sample for the tripartite agreement that of course our private industries or as a registered industries can check and understand what is this tripartite agreement Third, is the procurement of the vaccines exempted from other requirements from different agencies such as FDA? Fourth, if we import the vaccine, will it still be subjected to the prioritization list of the government? Because there's a question from our Facebook audience that some they observe some companies are rolling out their vaccination programs to their employees and their for their private employees. But uh is this not subject to prioritization or the exemption to the prioritization list? And lastly, is there any duties and taxes to be imposed for the procurement of the vaccines? Or are there incentives for the procurement of the vaccines? So ma'am, sir, uh, Dr. Howe, Dr. Herbosa, I give you the floor to answer these so, questions, so please. For, uh, yeah. Hi, Sige. I, I think I'll start off because many of the questions here, Dr. Herbosa, would be uh, the better one to, to answer. No? But I think I'll give an, uh, the, the statement that we're implementing one national program across the country. No? So regardless if it's bought um, by the national government, by the private sector, uh, and all of the others who will be procuring on their own, uh, we are still implementing one program. So that means all of the process have to take place across uh, all of the different procurement methods. And that includes passing through the FDA, not only the vaccines that have uh, authorization from the FDA can be procured, yung ating mga processes po ng logistics, ng reporting, ng supply chain. So that has to encompass uh, regardless of the procurement uh, modality. No? And, and yun nga po, it will also encompass following the prioritization. So as explained naman kanina by Dr. Ted, uh, it means lang din po na within your institution, you have to prioritize the same people that uh, the national government is prioritizing. And then I'll hand over to Dr. Ted to discuss the more specifics about the procurement in the type of Thank, Thank you, you Dr. Adnika. That's very clear, no? Uh, you, as the private sector, will have to follow the national vaccine deployment plan and all the steps and must report to the National Vaccine Operation Center or NVOC, which actually controls all these operations. So, hindi pwedeng basta bili kayo, bahala kay sa buhay nyo. Uh, cannot be done. Also, the other thing about question one is that if you're going to buy a vaccine and it requires special cold storage, that cold storage must be available already to you when you when the vaccines are delivered. So there's a lot of preparation, especially for the ultra cold chain, uh, uh, the uh, freezers that are necessary to receive it. On question number two, what is the template? The tripartite agreements are covered by non-disclosure agreements because of the price. Uh, this is requested by the private company. So unfortunately, we cannot share their contracts because of the requirement of the uh, vaccine manufacturer. Because I think they sell different prices based on the volume what people are getting and that's why the private sector is best partnering with the government because uh, it is the bulk purchase of government that lowers the price so with your, your additional order what happens is we are all able to get the best price for the bulk order for the vaccine so that's the concept of the tripartite agreement hindi lang government ang babayad the private sector will pay but it's actually a government procurement. Remember, all the vaccines are not yet for, for sale. It has not been given approval by the FDA for sale. It has only been given what is called an EUA, an emergency use authorization to the government. Gobyerno po ang binigyan. So sabi ng gobyerno, may mga bakuna na. Ang bakuna mukhang effective. So gagamitin natin. 
pero experimental pa sila. So ang may authority lang po ay gobyerno. Ang binigyan din, it's very important also to understand this because if you're going to do on a tripartite, remember the, the indemnity clause only pays the government. So kailangan if you're private and you want to do a vaccine program with experimental drugs and someone dies or gets harmed, the indemnity money is actually with the government. So you cannot do this without the government. So yun ang, yun ang ibig sabihin nito, no? you cannot buy on your own. And even if you you want to buy on your own, I doubt if any of the vaccine companies will sell to you, especially if you have a small order. So you really have to partner with government on this one. It's not that we're forcing you. That's the way it is all over the world. Uh, number three question, is the procurement of the vaccines exempted from requirements of the food and drug? Uh, of course not. Uh, that's why it's given an EUA. So partly I've answered that with stating that all the drugs are now given EUA. And so far, ang nabigyan ay Pfizer, Astra, Sinovac, Yamaleya, and recently I heard uh, Johnson & Johnson was also given e EUA, parang recently. So these are the uh, Novavax also. So anim na yung may approval yata na tinatawag na EUA. Hindi pa rin siya CPR or Certificate of Project Registration. A CPR is the one that authorizes sale in the country. So none of these vaccines are for sale. So the other thing that's important in the tripartite is none must profit. So you've heard people ask money from their employees to buy the vaccines or to reserve. The important thing that we assure is that no one should profit from those. So if the vaccine is sold at $20, the payment of the person who wants to reserve one should be $20, and the private company cannot profit on it. So that's that's what is not allowed. So the, the private sector is allowed to buy, but the private sector is not allowed to profit from this vaccine program. So number four, uh, when we import the vaccine, yes, there will still be the usual taxation but there is some exemption, I think, if you, you join with government. Pero meron pa rin yata ang VAT yan. And, you know, sa, pero pero uh, waived yung what we call custom duties. But the VAT, because that's created by law, parang kasama pa rin yan. So I will stand corrected here kasi hindi ko alam yung masyadong details yan. But uh, baka in exempt lahat, I don't know. But I know for a fact that there are laws or Republic Act na hindi mo pwedeng ma-change. So yung VAT sigurado ako, pero yung costume duties, pwede natin i-exempt yan in, in terms of the legal framework. I think that answers the five questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Howe and Dr. Herbosa. Uh, actually, we're overwhelmed with a lot of more questions because we have more than a thousand viewers in our YouTube and Facebook platforms. But uh, I want, may I add at least two more questions? Uh, I believe these are pressing questions or good questions to raise. So there's a comment, we received information that Moderna and AstraZeneca orders are already closed. Is there a timeline when this will be available again for the private sector? For the AstraZeneca, I can confirm that AstraZeneca, the, the country's quota has been reached for AstraZeneca. So even if you want to buy AstraZeneca now, AstraZeneca say we will not sell to you anymore because you've ordered over to about 20 million doses, which was our quota. So, because they have many orders all over the country. So the, Moderna, I do not know. Uh, what I know is what closed was the Razon Group. The Razon Group closed their uh, call for orders. So if you want to join Moderna, you'd have to create another group, actually, to try and order. But I think the supply of Moderna is limited also as well. So because these are being distributed in the United States. So both Pfizer and Moderna has been kept by North America and the North American countries. So medyo mahirap doon sa talaga yung order. So we are left with the Chinese-made vaccines and the uh, Indian, Serum Institute of Indian-made vaccines. So those are the two, and the Russian. So those are the three. So if you're still interested to actually order, those are the three sources you should be looking at. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, Dr. Herbosa. Last question and I'll for, for our government expert on vaccine procurement. If there is non-disclosure of prices, can you give us at least the vaccine price range of COVID vaccines to be procured? Price range. Hindi ko alam, pero the proper price range range anywhere from very low $4 for AstraZeneca, $3 pa yata sa iba. 
uh, uh, to as high as thirty dollars, twenty five or thirty dollars per dose. So yun yung price range, no? So it's a very wide range. Uh, I know for a fact yung yung uh, parang magkano ba? Kasi sinabi seven hundred million ang binayad natin for one million doses. So alam ko na yung price <laughs> by recomputing seven hundred pesos per dose yung ating side of box. So, so yun, yun yung government price. But they didn't say that. I just computed because they said they were going to pay 700 million for 1 million doses. So what do you mean? The Sinovac was bought by the government at 700 pesos per dose. But when you ask the private company, I think it's 1,500 per dose. And then for the two doses, it's going to be 3,000. So it's a different price when they... So yeah, that's why there's non-disclosure of the pricing. Because it's different from the price. Thank you, sir. At least that gave us an idea and all the audiences here. No? Thank you, Dr. Hao and Dr. Herbosa. We're, in behalf of PESA, we thank you so much for your time uh, and um, for the substantial information shared to our audiences. In terms of the tax incentives or um, incentives for procuring the vaccines, um, more of that may be discussed by our PESA Deputy Director General in our program this morning. So again, we thank our government experts on vaccine procurement, Dr. Hao and Dr. Herbosa. And um, we would now like to move on to the second part of the program, uh, focusing on private sector COVID vaccination management. So we have three resource persons from the private sector. So um, the, we will see now how the private sector is managing their vaccination uh, programs. Of course, in coordination with the government, and following government rules and regulations. The first speaker from the private sector is the head of the Philippine Red Cross or PRC Molecular Laboratory. She also served as Secretary of Health from July 2016 to October 2017. She kick-started her career as rural health practice volunteer in Kidapawa, North Cotabato, 1988. Dr. Russell Ubial has served public office for 29 years with those here, she was awarded as one of the 10 outstanding young women of Cotabat City. Ladies and gentlemen, PESA brings to you Ms. Pauline Jean B. Rosel Obial. Good morning, Dr. Rosel Obial. Uh, yes, good morning, everyone. Um, uh, it's a pleasure always to be with you this morning and to shed light on the Philippine Red Cross initiatives on COVID-19 response. Uh, the Philippine Red Cross is actually categorized as a private sector uh, agency, but we are truly a humanitarian agency. So if ever we earn, sabihin nga nila, in, in whatever endeavor that we have, like uh, in our testing, uh, it doesn't go to the owners of the company it goes back as programs of the Philippine Red Cross to serve and to respond to health emergencies in the country. So that's what's different with us, with the private sector, but we are labeled private sector organization. Um, I will skip the first few slides because I really didn't know uh, what will be. Please go to slide number 17. I will just be discussing two important initiatives of the Philippine Red Cross, and that's the saliva RT-PCR and the vaccination, COVID-19 vaccine that we will be rolling out. So I just like to inform everybody the biggest contribution of the Philippine Red Cross to the COVID-19 pandemic response is setting up 13 molecular laboratories across the country. We're testing 26% of the entire country. And as of March 19, uh, in this slide, we have uh, tested 2.14 million uh, tests across the country. And the second is Detoxicare, that's a private laboratory with 583,000 and our ITM is at 463,000. So you can see that the Philippine Red Cross actually is um, quadruple the next uh, 
uh, laboratory in line, the output of the Philippine Red Cross. Next slide. And um, I'd like to inform everyone that we're the only uh, accredited laboratory of the DOH and now with the FDA and our ITM to provide saliva RT-PCR tests in the country. And this is the meta-analysis that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine in January 2021, where many of the validation tests across the world actually does a sample size of around 200 to 300 parallel samples of both saliva and swab. They did a pooled or meta-analysis of all these samples. And as you can see, they got uh, 5,922 um, uh, subjects for this pooled meta-analysis and they got 941 positive and 4,981 negative. And in summary, what the pooled analysis uh, shows is that the saliva RT-PCR sensitivity and specificity is equal to the swab RT-PCR sensitivity and specificity. So, walang statistical significance yung difference nila. So we say that saliva RT-PCR is as accurate as the gold standard of swab RT-PCR, which is now being provided by the Philippine Red Cross at 2,000 per test. And hopefully we get uh, the PhilHealth to cover and make it part of their benefit package, the saliva RT-PCR. So it's available in all Red Cross laboratories and in all Red Cross chapters across the country. So we test even in Tawi-Tawi, in Sulu, in Batanes, where we don't have laboratory. Uh, the chapter collects it in those islands, sends it to the nearest laboratory, Tawi-Tawi in Sulu, to Sambuanga, Batanes, to Manila or even Isabela Laboratory. So uh, we don't have laboratory in Region 1 and in Bicol, but they send the samples to our laboratories here in Manila. Saliva samples are viable at room temperature for up to seven days. So no need, no need for cold chain. Next. And then, um, I, I think I'll go to the next slide about the vaccination. Next slide. Ito, uh, the previous slide pala. I just want to point out something very important, especially to PESA workers and to office workers. No, This is a study done by the UPPGH way back uh, May 2020 that the number one cause of transmission in the workplace is actually eating together. So we have banned eating together in the Philippine Red Cross. Our pantry is now empty. You have to get your food, eat in your workplace with nobody in front of you and no talking at all. So that's the rule now in the Philippine Red Cross and we have stopped the uh, cases in the office. So I advise the uh, locators of PESA, if you can do this, stop the practice of having canteens or have your canteens face the wall so your employees do not talk together when they eat or they congregate. Next slide. So this is the 98% of our uh, cases are asymptomatic or mild, and only 2% needs hospitalization. That's why the Philippine Red Cross has also worked with government to establish isolation facilities in schools. So we have now in Ateneo and in UP and upcoming soon in St. Benilde and Adamson University and many, many more universities we hope to assist government 
in the isolation component of the COVID response. Next. So isolation in Philippine Red Cross facilities are free. We work with the local government, with the national government, so that uh, these are provided free. And the schools uh, provide all the utilities for free, the water and the light and the Wi-Fi. Next slide. Hindi ko na I think uh, we'll go to slide number 20 because that's the vaccination. And I agree with Dr. Herbosa. That's it. Yes. Uh, hindi na yan. Isolation na yan. Next, yan. That's the vaccine. So the Philippine Red Cross has actually discussed or network with the uh, government, of course. It's a tripartite agreement and Moderna and AstraZeneca as well as Gamaleya Sputnik V and Novavax. So those are the four uh, companies that we talk to. And the arrangement is like uh, Dr. Herbosa said, no loss, no profit. So we will get the vaccines at cost, offer it to people who come to our vaccination sites and uh, our target is to establish 100 va uh, vacuna centers of the Philippine Red Cross in all our chapters nationwide. Currently, we have uh, four vacuna centers in Metro Manila, and that's providing vaccines from the government. So it's free, Wala, walang bayad as of the moment, because we get our vaccines from the government and um, we provide it to, to the priority as listed by uh, the Department of Health. But uh, later on, if we procure the vaccines from Moderna, for example, we have adopted the Go Negotio scheme of buy one, donate one. So, and it's no profit, no loss. So aside from the cost of the vaccine, we will be charging also the delivery cost, the cost of Red Cross to actually deliver the shots to the arm of the patient. So may cost yan eh, yung syringes, needles, the human resource, the uh, transportation, the cold storage, etc. No, So our, our current estimate is that the delivery cost is around $6. So it's about 300 pesos per dose. And the vaccine uh, cost, whatever that is, as mentioned by Dr. Ted, for example, I think uh, some of the negotiations with Moderna were looking at 26 to $27. You add the delivery cost, that's about $33 per dose. So, 1,500. And so, if you have two doses, that's 3,000. But we're implementing uh, buy one, donate one. So, the buy one, you pay for that 3,000. And you donate one, that's another 3,000. So, 6,000 and all. The donate one will be given by the Red Cross to our list of beneficiaries because we have like uh, uh, we provide ayuda, yung cash grants, no, to the different uh, low income or victims of typhoons and fire. And so we have a list like that, and that's where we provide the donate one uh, scheme. So if um, uh, the private companies will work with us, that is the scheme that we are adopting. Of course, if we get uh, Gamaleya, I think that's about uh, $10 per dose. So the, the cost is about $13 per dose. So that's about 500, 600 pesos. And two doses is uh, uh, 1,200. Buy one, donate one is 2,400. So just to give you an idea, and Novavax, I think, is the cheapest of the four that 
Uh, AstraZeneca is also around 300 pesos per dose. So 300 plus the delivery cost is 600 per dose. And so that's the idea of the uh, offering of the Philippine Red Cross for vaccination. And the earliest that we can start vaccination according to our negotiations is uh, Moderna sometime in June, late June to early July. The other vaccines, the Sputnik, the AstraZeneca, and the uh, Novavax will be available on the third quarter of this year. So that's it. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Tobial. So there goes our first speaker for the private sector COVID vaccine, co-vaccination management. We have two more speakers for this second part of our program. Um, I'm requesting please Dr. Obial to remain with us because there will be a Q&A after, after all the discussion of the other two speakers. So now we move on to the second speaker of this second part of the program. She is the Senior Advisor on ASEAN BAC Philippines and the Program Lead for A Dose of Hope. She's a strategic and business development advisor convening the Angat Lahat Sa Digital, translated as Prosperity for All in Digital, movement for small businesses in the Philippines and ASEAN. She's currently involved with FinTech Magpai. I am an EduTech Aptitude Infotech Solutions and Global Learning Access. Since March last year, she has been leading the COVID-19 readiness campaigns of Go Negosho to make coronavirus testing innovations and vaccines accessible to Philippine enterprises. Ladies and gentlemen, Feza brings to you, we are pleased to introduce to you Ms. Josephine or Jopin Romero. Good morning, Ms. Romero. We now give the floor to our resource speaker. Ms. Hi, Josephine. good morning. Good morning. Good morning, and thank you for inviting me. Uh, thank you, uh, Director General Plaza, for organizing this very important uh, briefing of all the locators who are here today and for bringing in uh, such a group of esteemed speakers to share their information. Um, I would like to share a little bit of what uh, Gordon Gosho and the Office of the Presidential Advisor for Entrepreneurship, OPAE, led by uh, Presidential Advisor Joey Concepcion has been doing for the last uh, 13 months since March of 2020. So um, I'll touch on uh, a little bit on uh, procurement as well as the administration of the vaccines that have been procured by private sector. Next slide, please. Next slide. Okay, so, so in the next slide, you will just see a picture of uh, something that uh, Dr. Arbosa uh, has already mentioned. Uh, this is the signing of uh, the tripartite agreement. In fact, the first uh, tripartite agreement by private sector together with government was signed in November of 2020 when a group of private sector, uh, even without uh, EUA, uh, released to... Uh, 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 AstraZeneca Philippines regarding AstraZeneca vaccine uh, or AstraZeneca for that matter um, in anywhere in the world uh, already bet on the vaccine because uh, we wanted to make sure that the Philippines does not lose its place in the supply chain, the global supply chain. As we see today, there is a bit of a shortage of uh, vaccines around the world uh, because the demand is higher than uh, the pace at which supply can be uh, made available. So as early as November, when uh, AstraZeneca and all the other vaccines have not even been approved by their origin, countries of origin, uh, a bunch of companies, Filipino companies, already put some money down so that we will reserve production for the Philippines. And this is the 20 million um, quota that Dr. Herbosa shared. So this particular slide that you're looking at is uh, in January, January of this year, the second wave or the second tripartite agreement in which um, 38 or 39 um, government uh, uh, units 
also uh, procured 11 million vaccines together with a total of about 6 million from private sector. This is in particular AstraZeneca. In total, uh, a dose of hope, the program of uh, uh, PA Joey Concepcion and Goni Gosho helped procure uh, so far about 20 million vaccines. And this is ongoing. Next slide, please. So here is just a, a timeline of all the um, collaboration we've, uh, we've done uh, together with government and private sector. But most re remarkable here of which, uh, I mean, I will not do it, well on the other um, timelines. Uh, this uh, these slides are shareable anyway. We will share this with uh, with people. So those who'd be interested can read some more. But most re remarkable of which is the the goal of Goni Gosho and the Office of the Presidential Advisor for Entrepreneurship is to help make testing and vaccines accessible to everybody. And not only that, we also want to make sure that there is uh, a way for businesses to become resilient, not only to survive, but also to, th to thrive uh, even in this pandemic. So besides um, providing um, the facility to access testing and vaccines, we also made sure that um, they have access to guidance from medical advisors and also from industry experts to pivot the way they do business the way they keep their people safe, and the way uh, they can re-engineer their business, like I said, to survive and thrive. So um, next slide, please. All right. Um, I'd like to emphasize a point that was uh, made by Dr. Herbosa and Dr. Obial. What we're doing here is uh, to help people, particularly MSMEs for, for Go Negosyo, at a no profit, no loss, and no privilege access. Uh, of the vaccines. These vaccines are not yet ready for commercial sale. These vaccines are all, when you sign a tripartite agreement uh, to acquire the vaccines, you are signing it, but the consignee would still be the DOH, Department of Health. And this is for all of our protection. We would rely on government um, to ensure that uh, these are still safe and that continuous observation of the effects or the impact of the vaccines on us, the people who are being vaccinated, will continue to be observed. And until then, until uh, the government and the regulatory bodies are sure, then that would be the only time that these vaccines can be available for sale. So um, please don't think that uh, these restrictions are for you to have a difficult time in acquiring the vaccines. No, definitely not, but it is for our safety. Um, Goni Gosho and the OPAE has been participating in public and private consultative meetings. And this, I think, is very important to point out because it is in these meetings that we are appealing for uh, an example I would uh, mention that's very important is, for instance, the um, um, broader definition of A4 or the priority or essential workers. So uh, for the la in the last few weeks, um, you would have seen um, the gradual change of uh, the definition and the inclusion of uh, the work roles under A4, where most of us, but not all of us, fall um, from a mere, I think, seven subcategories in A4. As of uh, last week, I believe there are about 17 subcategories already. And we continue to um, appeal to government and to explain uh, the importance of uh, other job roles that they may not yet see are as important as the others. As of now, um, as we look at the, as we develop the micro plan for vaccination and administration for the 20 million vaccines um, acquired through the Dose of Hope program, we are seeing that um, the categories of the workers fall within A1, uh, Group A, and Group B. So um, it is uh, it is a very involved process. Uh, but it is a requirement for when private sector acquire their vaccines, they are also supposed to submit a micro plan to government, to national, to the national task force, and to NITAG for approval, uh, uh, so that uh, we ensure that uh, uh, the priority sectors are being covered first over uh, those that can wait. Um, we are also coordinating closely with the LGUs, particularly for the implementation of the vaccine. Um, this is very important. Right now, we are working with 168 
LGUs, uh, the companies and uh, the LGUs that purchased uh, the vaccine in November and uh, January are uh, within uh, this 168 LGUs. We want to make sure that the data of the people are uh, lodged properly uh, with the LGUs and the DICT where the vaccine database is uh, is being uh, taken cared, cared of and then uh, reported uh, accordingly. So um, this also is uh, uh, an effort uh, for many of us, especially the private sector companies because we are not used to doing this, but again, it is a must that we follow this. Um, and then uh, Gonigosha and the OPAE is also conducting safety literacy initiatives uh, and uh, pivot mentorship sessions, particularly uh, besides the survival and thrive uh, objectives I mentioned earlier, to reduce vaccine hesitancy among our, um, our different work groups. Next slide, please. Okay, so this is just uh, uh, to give you an idea of how many companies or enterprises are already in the network uh, of the Go Negotiation OPAE. So over a thousand companies and uh, about uh, 6.6 .6 million doses. These account only for the, the doses that are allotted for the workers. These do not account for the donations to government and the purchases of the LGUs. Um, and uh, this would also be still uh, still be a growing number. AstraZeneca and Moderna are, are already closed facilities as of uh, February of this year. However, um, Covovax um, and uh, of Novavax, the company, and then uh, Covaxin of Bharat uh, orders are still ongoing, uh, which is actually very good because uh, the the minimum. Uh, order quantity for these two brands, Covavax and Barat, are, are uh, smaller than uh, the minimums in AstraZeneca and Moderna. So for the smaller companies uh, and smaller business organizations, these are this would be better fit uh, in terms of affordability and accessibility. Next slide, please. Okay, so, so just a summary of uh, industries covered by uh, the, the enterprises uh, already with the network. So um, if you see here, uh, I think, I believe uh, most of uh, the people in the room would be in the manufacturing, even construct, uh, even BPO um, category. Um, so these two right now, I believe, are not yet um, explicitly stated in A4, in priority group A4. And part of our objective when we make a presentation of the private sector plan to NITAG or the Interim um, National Immunization Technology Advisory Group uh, this week is to um, explain to them why it is important that manufacturing in general and particular work roles in manufacturing in production as well as BPO uh, should be uh, made priority uh, work roles uh, and covered uh, immediately by vaccination. Next slide, please. Okay, so let's go to the particular um, vaccine brands that are available today. So Covovax, which is um, distributed in the Philippines by Faberco Life Sciences and Unilab, has partnered with Gonigosho specifically to reach out to the smaller enterprises. The minimum order quantity here is not as much as uh, the previous uh, vaccines as mentioned, it's about 200 doses. Um, there are uh, still small enterprises who cannot afford to buy uh, or who do not have 100 employees. Uh, that's why um, we are helping to consolidate that. Covaxin by Bharat Biotech of India. Um, oh, Novavax incidentally is uh, uh, R&D is in the United States and then Bharat Biotech is in India. Now this is distributed by um, IP Biotech in the Philippines and Ambika uh, Tech. Uh, and uh, the minimum order quantity here is uh, 320 doses. Again, um, this is something that we part they, they approached us and asked us to um, reach out to micro and small uh, and medium enterprises to, uh, to spread the word about uh, this particular vaccine. Next slide, please. All right, so this is Covovax. 
you can of course go directly to uh, Unilab, uh, which is taking the orders, um, and we'll show you. But we'll show you in the next uh, in in two two slides later how to acquire this through GoNegosho. Next slide, please. Um, this is Covaxin, the Barat. So both for this uh, slide and the other slide, um, I would I need not explain this because, uh, like I said, um, these slides will be shared to you anyway. But for initial information, these are two vaccines that are available in the Philippines already. Um, as of yesterday, Covaxin already uh, was, um, was issued a conditional EUA by FDA. Novavax is not yet issued uh, an EUA, but uh, it is in the works. And uh, the distributor, the company and the distributor estimates this, uh, the EUA process to start in May. And that, uh, Next slide, please. Okay, so um, cost of vaccine per dose. I know this was a question earlier, so um, I'll share with you here. Covovax is at 1,000 pesos per dose, inclusive of warehousing and cold, cold storage delivery fees. This is very important, this cold chain and the warehousing, because we want to make sure that the integrity of the vaccine is, uh, is kept. Um, prices may be lower uh, than one th the price may be lower than 1,000 per dose, according to um, Faberco and Unilab, depending on uh, taxation policies of government. Uh, as was mentioned by uh, Dr. Ted Herbosa, there are some things that uh, have yet to be finalized when it comes to taxation. Um, delivery of the vaccines will be nationwide. As uh, many people know, Unilab has a very strong distribution system around the country from uh, Tawi-Tawi to uh, Batanes, um, so they can deliver to any DOH accredit accredited um, um, facility. Um, and uh, please note that no deliveries will be made to individuals, only to accredited facilities uh, for any of the vaccines that are under the GoNegosho network. Now for co-vaccine, this is at 900 pesos per dose if you pick it up from NAIA. But the pickup is very strict, of course. Like I said, um, cold chain uh, should be assured to um, because of the um, because of the requirements of the vaccine. Now, um, if delivery to your vaccination center uh, will be included in your purchase or in your acquisition, it will be 950 pesos per dose, and this is nationwide. Okay. So um, next slide, please. All right, the cost of the administration is not covered under the COVAX, but, uh, and, and the COVAXIN prices I just mentioned. Um, however, there is a way for you to um, be able to contact health service providers. Uh, Unilab itself has, um, has in its uh, business network um, Reliance and Mount Grace Hospitals, but it's also open to partnering uh, with LGUs or delivering to LGUs, regional health units, and your choice of uh, healthcare facility. For co-vaccine, um, delivery inoculation package uh, is, uh, is an option, and this will be explained in more detail by uh, the next speaker, which is IT Biotech. Uh, um, uh, the COO uh, Roach, and uh, but for your initial information, it's uh, at 425 pesos per person for a single location. Okay. Um, now on the vaccine administration, um, for those who purchased AstraZeneca, um, well, I suppose also for the vaccine, for the other brands of vaccines, in a meeting with the Department of Health um, um, Committee on Allocation and Administration uh, last week, um, it is possible, especially for the smaller companies that uh, will have difficulty affording, uh, besides the vaccine, also the administration cost, um, for you to um, coordinate closely with your LGU and RHU or regional health unit um, to seek uh, help on the administration. So as long as you purchase your vaccine, there may be a facility for you through government um, um, offices, uh, either your LGU or DOH, uh, regional health units and uh, city health units to help with the administration. 
So, but that's something that you need to deliberately um, coordinate with them because as of um, as of now, the assumption is that if you buy your vaccine, you would also take care of your administration. Um, okay, next slide, please. Okay, so the procurement process is very simple. Um, an initial email to Godigosho um, to indicate your um, your um, what, interest uh, to buy a particular number of vaccines, and then you will be given the step-by-step -step process to acquire the vaccines. Um, more likely, like for Covovax, we will direct you already to Unilab, or you can go directly directly to Unilab. However, we want to make sure that uh, um, the uh, companies are properly briefed. That's why also Unilab partnered with us because they needed our help to explain the little details prior to any company signing a term sheet or a purchase agreement. Uh, one uh, one um, um, specific information of note is that um, as a vaccine, while we are allowed to choose a vaccine that does not yet have EUA, our advice to companies is not to provide uh, dip any deposit uh, or any money to the company unless um, the company has already acquired um, EUA from uh, the regulatory bodies. Uh, this will be uh, an added protection for you so that you're assured that uh, your vaccines will uh, be delivered to the country because no vaccine with, uh, without an EUA will be allowed to enter into the country. Next slide, please. For co-vaccine, vaccine now that the uh, EUA approval has been uh, issued as of yesterday, um, they are, uh, we are now um, encouraging the companies to make their reservations. In fact, Covaxin is one of those vaccines that will be coming sooner than later. Um, if um, if um, um, the orders and the paperwork will be um, processed um, as expected, we believe that uh, Covaxin uh, will be available in the country by next month. So, um, a simple note to Nego Negosho, which is the official private sector partner of uh, Ambitech and the IP Biotech when it comes to ordering for private sector, will um, uh, initiate your ordering process. A final um, ordering, uh, the final order will be um, attested by a signed memorandum of agreement. Now, the memorandum of agreement will be a mirror of the tripartite agreement that Ambika, IP Biotech, um, will be signing with the National uh, Task Force Against COVID-19 and Department of Health. Okay, next slide, please. All right, so I think that's it. That's it for my, my slide. Um, I'd like to make sure that everybody understands that when it comes to administration, we are co coordinating very closely with our, 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 our logistics partner for AstraZeneca, Zuilig uh, Pharma Corporation. And uh, we are lucky to have, um, like I mentioned, no, uh, about a thousand uh, companies in our membership and several of the large companies have volunteered to provide uh, venues, free venues for shared vaccination administration. The venues will be free, which will uh, considerably lessen your cost of uh, vaccination. Um, but the actual vaccination will still have a cost if you are going to get a uh, private sector healthcare provider to, to, to do it for you. Um, of course, it will be a different story if you ask your LGU or regional health unit to help you with that. So um, the uh, the key here is to coordinate with us, coordinate with Goni Gosho so that, um, and, uh, so that we can um, link you to, um, to the right uh, manufacturer or consolidator of orders and to ensure that you're also um, linked properly to the logistics companies because at this point i mean when if uh, it is important to have a clustering of the vaccines due to the uh, uneven number of deliveries per location so um, our our role here is really to um, consolidate and to ensure that the proper information is disseminated to the companies thank you very much Maraming salamat. Thank you very much for that very informative presentation.
Ms. Josephine or Jopin Romero, the Senior Advisor for ASEAN Back Philippines and Program Lead for A Dose of Hope. She gave us a very informative presentation about Go Negotiates program to make coronavirus testing innovations and vaccine procurement accessible to Philippine enterprises, including for our audience audiences who are PESA registered companies. Now we will move on to our third speaker, but request Dr. Uh, Ms. Romero to please remain with us as there will be a Q&A after our third speaker for the second part of the discussion on private sectors vaccine procurement. So finally, but definitely not the least, our last speaker is the Chief Operating Officer or COO of IP Biotech Incorporated, the local distributor of the COVID-19 vaccine, Covaxin manufactured by Bharat Biotech. So over with, over with 20 years of work experience in sales and distribution across diverse industries in pharmaceutical, fast-moving consumer goods and utilities, Mr. Roche has served as head of sales for Sanofi Aventis Philippines Incorporated. He worked as national key accounts for Wrigley Philippines Incorporated. Further, he was the regional sales manager for national key accounts in Nestle Vietnam Limited and was part of the task force responsible for, for conceptualizing and implementing the distributorship model of Nestle Philippines Incorporated for general trade. Je ladies and gentlemen, Peza is pleased to introduce to you and bring to you Mr. Carlo Roach Garucho, COO of IP Biotech Incorporated. Good morning, maganda umaga po. It's already actually lunchtime. The floor is open for your discussion, Sir Garucho. Hi, good lunch to everyone. Um, I'd specifically like to say thanks to a few people uh, before starting the presentation. Um, I'd, I'd like to say thank you to the entire PESA group uh, for inviting IP Biotech to present. Uh, I'd also like to personally uh, thank and publicly thank uh, Ambassador Shambhu Kumaran, who is the Indian ambassador assigned to the Philippines, who was who was instrumental um, in uh, in the conditional EUA that was granted to IP Biotech for Covaxin. Also instrumental is Ambassador Ramon Bagatsing, who is the Philippine ambassador assigned in India. And then two other individuals instrumental in the conditional EUA is is Mr. Joey Concepcion of Go Negocio, and then Ms. Jopin Romero, who just presented. So thank you to these four individuals and I have to really call them out. So getting straight into the meat of things, uh, if you could go to the next slide, please. So it's a very straightforward process. We've streamlined it over time um, and we are very, uh, how do I say this? We are compliant to Republic Act 11525 as well as to the implementing rules and regulations. So it's a five step process. It's a non-binding letter of intent uh, signed by a duly authorized representative. Then uh, the same representative to sign a non-disclosure agreement or a confiden confidentiality agreement. After which we will very uh, immediately put forward a standard proposal and term sheet where all of the commercial terms are, are indicated. Although that was already shared um, by, by Ms. Jofin earlier. And uh, there are no deviations with regard to the costs that were, that were presented. Um, immediately upon uh, uh, signing of the term sheet, we recommend a down payment to be put forward, which will confirm the order. And uh, while a purchase, the final document, which is the purchase agreement, is being reviewed and then signed as well. So it's really just a, a streamlined five-step process. Uh, in terms of cost components, next slide, please. There are three, as mentioned by Ms. Chopin. There is a purchase cost landed cost in ex -Naya. There is a warehousing and delivery cost uh, to any part of the Philippines, uh, care of our uh, provider, which is Distrifil. And then the third cost is that of inoculation done by a subsidiary company of IP Biotech called Health Direct Now. Um, please take note that the MOQ that we recommend is that of one inner box of Covaxin, which is 320 doses or good for 160 people, 160. Next slide, please. So in terms of payment terms, there are two tranches. There's a 50% payment 
uh, upon signing of the term sheet, and then the balance 50% after seven days. Uh, and now that we have the conditional EOA, uh, we do recommend, uh, most especially for small batch orders, that 100% be put forward. Um, IP Biotech has an allocation of 8 million doses, uh, majority of which has been pencil allocated out already. Um, but the pencil allocations, uh, most of them, uh, most, uh, sorry, there are some uh, companies who are waiting for payment details, which we will release shortly, um, within the day actually. Uh, and then um, confirmation of orders uh, and allocations uh, after which. So as mentioned, IP Biotech has, a, has an initial batch commitment from Bharat Biotech worth 8 million doses. Deliveries will start to enter the Philippines uh, in May of 2021. And we hope that all tranche deliveries uh, will conclude in November of this year. Um, uh, designated representatives of IP Biotech are, are waiting for cases uh, in India to go down because a, a party is to fly out to India and to request slash negotiate for a second and much larger batch uh, set of deliveries for the Philippines and for private market access. Uh, next slide, please. Ah, okay. So this is not the most recent uh, version of my presentation. So unfortunately, this slide actually contains the contact details of three individuals, myself, Deepu of Ambitech, and then Mon Gloria of, uh, of Health Direct Now, as well as our mobile numbers and then email addresses. So I, I hope that the correct information will be shared to all members so that you can start to contact us. So as mentioned, IP Biotech and Ambitech are in charge of the purchasing. And should you choose to go through warehousing and delivery care of our service provider, then we, we do that for you. And the third individual, Mr. Mon Gloria of Health Direct Now, is our inoculation service provider. Next slide, please. So that ends my presentation. Um, thank you very much again for having us. Thank you very much, uh, COO, Mr. Garucho. That was very brief discussion. But I believe he also shared important information for the private sector's vaccination program. And now we move on to the Q&A portion for the second part of the program. We have shortlisted top five questions for this topic on private sectors or enterprises access to vaccine procurement. And we are actually overwhelmed with so many questions from Facebook or YouTube, and but we have to limited to top five questions for our speakers due to time limitations. But again, I would like to reiterate to our audience that the presentations of our speakers are available uh, through a link that we will show later on. That resor uh, resources will be accessible when you fill up the evaluation form for this online dialogue. So again, thank you to our speakers for making their slides available to us. Now we are flashing the top five questions for our three speakers for the private sector vaccine procurement. We have here five. So let me read them to the three speakers. Uh, I would like to ask our three speakers to agree on who will entertain the questions or if you all want to address them. So first, how can private companies procure vaccines for COVID-19? Are there specific procedures do we have to observe? Based on information from DOH, companies have to execute a tripartite agreement between national government and the vaccine manufacturers. So what specifically shall we indicate on the agreement and how shall this be executed? Second question, is it mandatory for private companies to get their employees vaccinated and all expenses will be shouldered by the company or the employer? What about the employees who didn't want or don't want to get vaccinated? Third, can private companies directly avail of the vaccines from suppliers or will it be through government agencies or again, the tripartite agreement? Fourth, what is the liability of company if adverse effects will develop or will be felt after employees get inoculated? Lastly, how can PESA help PESA registered companies with the procurement of COVID-19 vaccines? Or will PESA accredited companies be the one to 
liaise with the government and private company sellers of vaccines directly. But I would like to reserve this fifth question, of course, to our as a Deputy Director General who is with us in this online dialogue, who will give us the closing remarks and wrap up for this dialogue. So um, to our speaker, three speakers for the private sector, I hope you can enlighten us on the four questions listed. So I, I can Okay. I can take on question number one, but specifically answer only on behalf of IP Biotech and Ambitech. So I've detailed the the process uh, espoused by IP Biotech and uh, by Ambitech. Um, if in case you missed it, um, please secure my email address from from PESA, and please send me an email with a uh, with a request or an inquiry. Uh, to get the process going. Uh, there are five steps involved, the first of which is a non-binding letter of intent, the second of which is a confidentiality agreement or an NDA, the third is a standard proposal and term sheet, the fourth is a down payment, and then the fifth is a purchase agreement that has to be signed as well to consummate. Um, with regard to uh, co-vaccine that IP Biotech and Ambitech uh, is able to offer private market, uh, a tripartite between the company is no longer needed because the tripartite that is currently being reviewed and hopefully will be signed soonest involves IP Biotech, IATF, and then Ambitech, who is the consolidator of all orders. So that, that's my answer for number one. Right. Hello. To answer yes. number one as oh. well, um, and I will speak uh, because uh, Godegosha was the one who that negotiated the first tripartite for the country. Um, initially, it was really needed for all companies to sign the tripartite. And if you look at the AstraZeneca uh, uh, tripartite agreements, it will contain all the 1,000 companies that I shared with you earlier. But as explained, uh, as per my slide earlier and what, uh, and, and what Roach uh, just reiterated now, the, um, the purchase agreement and the term sheet that you will be signing uh, with the manufacturer, or in this case, the consolidator for the Philippines, which is uh, IP Biotech and Ambitech, um, will mirror the clauses, the relevant clauses already uh, in the tripartite agreement that they will be signing with um, what you call this, with NTF and with DOH. So when you do um, indicate your interest uh, to, um, to purchase a particular brand of vaccine, um, they will be very transparent with you and uh, give you uh, a clear idea of what will be written, what will be the terms uh, covered in the tripartite agreement that they are currently negotiating or have signed with government. So that's not something that you should be worried about. Secondly, um, uh, wait for it just a few more days. DOH is set to release the IRR uh, for private sector acquisition of uh, vaccines. Um, I know this for a fact because, uh, as you can imagine, private sector uh, was asked in consultative uh, meetings to give inputs. And um, you can be assured that they, the, the IRR uh, is, uh, seems practical, at least based on, on our uh, review uh, and the inputs that we gave to them. So you should be not too worried about uh, this type type. But just make sure that you have a clear letter of intent and term sheet signed with uh, the vaccine manufacturer or, or consolidator that you will be uh, acquiring your vaccines from. Now, uh, please go. Uh, should we answer all the questions or do we go one by one? Yes, please. I do. I believe um, for every speaker, you can be the one okay. answering. So I'll be quick. I'll be brief with, with the rest now. Is it mandatory for private companies to get their vac uh, employees vaccinated? Uh, no, it is not mandatory. But if you do get your employees vaccinated, it should be at no cost to the employees. Um, uh, right now, our responsibility as employers uh, or as partners of these workers who, who are working with us is to help them understand, uh, is to help them understand uh, the, uh, hello, am I here? Is to help them understand uh, uh, what they're getting into. So uh, that's why it's important to organize vaccine literacy sessions or Q&As for your employees. According to Dole, uh, a Dole um, circular 
uh, we should not uh, charge our employees. Now, um, there is a question where um, should families and dependents uh, be charged if the workers would like their families and dependents be covered as well. That is something that uh, still uh, being deliberated on by government. Um, can private companies directly avail of the vaccines from suppliers? Yes. So this will be very clear in the IRR. And as uh, Roach has already mentioned, you can go to them or to any point of contact um, that is uh, authorized. In fact, NTF has released a list of uh, um, focal persons from whom you can uh, ask uh, for um, information regarding um, vaccine acquisition. And this would most likely be the manufacturers and consolidators. Um, on the liability of the company, if adverse effects will develop after employees get inoculated, I think it was mentioned already um, by Dr. Tedder Boss earlier that the indemnity is owned by the government. So um, uh, that's why it's very important for, for our partners, our vaccine partners, to have in their system pharmacovigilance and for us to also cooperate by reporting any um, symptoms or adverse effects that we uh, feel after vaccination. It's a shared responsibility. We will have to report uh, what we feel to, um, uh, to, to, to the government through uh, these companies that have, uh, from where we purchase our vaccines or from, uh, that vaccinated us, that conducted the vaccination. Thank you. Hello, yes, you. good morning. Fabian, yes. you may want to add uh -oh. to the screen. Ah, yes, uh -oh. uh, with regards to private companies directly availing of the vaccines, I think that will have to be subject to new guidelines because the current guidelines is um, uh, private companies cannot access directly. It has to be a tripartite agreement between the, the government, the supplier, and the private company. And uh, with regards to the liability, I think that was uh, already mentioned that the, it will be government that will cover any expenses that uh, will result from adverse events following immunization. And um, the, the Red Cross, like uh, what I mentioned, our agreement is not to supply the vaccines to the company, but to deliver the doses to your employees. And I think that's also what the uh, uh, DOH and the other companies are doing because uh, uh, you cannot establish Bakuna centers left and right. It has to be accredited and it follows a very stringent um, accreditation process by the Department of Health. Merong certain standards that has to be followed. So what we're doing in the Red Cross is getting as many Bakuna centers uh, accredited by DOH so that when the vaccines arrive, we will deliver the doses to the um, people in your company. And how do we do that? You write us a letter of intent, you list down all the people, uh, uh, personnel and their dependents, and then uh, we assess how much you will pay. You pay the price and then we vaccinate. So that's how we're going to do it. I, I don't think that the companies are allowed to actually do their own vaccination unless they become Bakuna Center accredited. Thank you so much, Dr. Ubia. So if there's no more additional information or inputs from our speakers on this Q&A, I would like to uh, uh, give the floor to the Deputy Director General of PESA to address the fifth question. And actually he is reserved for our closing remarks. So he's also the proponent of this online dialogue on vaccine procurement of fellow registered companies. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for this um, opportunity and platform for our fellow registered companies to discuss the topic. Mm -hmm. Good afternoon, sir. I bring to you, I introduce to you Deputy Director General 
Hi, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you, Tasi. Uh, if I may proceed to answering first uh, question number five. Uh, according to DG Plaza in her uh, opening remarks this morning, uh, the role of PESA in the EcoZone vaccination program is more of an enabler. This means that PESA can help facilitate the procurement, the delivery, the administration of the vaccines for our locators. We can do uh, pooling of the demand for vaccines on a per echo zone basis for ease of administration. But the strategy really is really bit up to the locators to freely choose their own supplier and administrator of vaccines. This is the reason uh, for this dialogue today where we have invited three potential suppliers as part of our empowerment measures. And uh, like today, we have invited uh, Red Cross, we have Go Negocio and IP Biotech. And uh, in the case of PESA, for our own uh, vaccination for our employees, we are in talks with Medicard and Red Cross for Moderna brand and uh, for Biotech, uh, for co-vaccine, which is also being offered by Go Negocio. And so I'm sure we can find a way how we can get the parties, the suppliers to cooperate so that we can address the requirements of our locators. The other assistance that we can provide our locators is we may probably allow the tax and duty-free importation of the vaccines for uh, their own use, companies use for the locators. Uh, subject, of course, to the lifting of the emergency use authorization. Uh, if you recall, last year we have allowed for tax and duty free importation of uh, all PPEs, COVID related equipment by our locators as part of our relief measures. And so, with that, uh, if I may be allowed to proceed already to my closing, uh, first of all, I uh, would like to thank our resource persons and presenters for their. Very insightful presentation. We have uh, Dr. Howe, we have Dr. Erbosa, of course, uh, Dr. Obial, Ms. Romero, and uh, Mr. Roach Garucho. If we can give them a virtual round of applause. So, uh, to formally close this forum, um, may I leave you with these key takeaways from the presentations this morning? and other insights that we have uh, added, which we would like to impart as well on our audience. Number one is any approved COVID-19 vaccine is generally safe and effective. While it cannot guarantee uh, total immunity from the, from the COVID, it can certainly provide us additional safety or protection measure. Number two, there is no doubt about it. It makes sense to get ourselves vaccinated if you want to avoid getting hospitalized due to severe or critical COVID infection and worse, even dying from it. Number three, the vaccine is an easier way of attaining herd immunity than the natural infection caused by coronavirus. We gathered that the government, uh, the target of the government for herd immunity is 70% which uh, translates to about 73.5 million Filipinos. Rest assured that our government is doing everything to accelerate the rollout of vaccines to be able to achieve the target within the year. And number four, as reiterated by almost all our presenters today, uh, because of the difficulty with access to vaccine, the best COVID vaccine is the one that is readily available. So we don't have to be choosy with the vaccines if only we believe that all vaccines are safe and effective. So bottom line is it's either you get infected or you get vaccinated. The choice is yours. More importantly, if I may share also this appeal of DOH USEC Dr. Vergeri, which applies to all responsible citizens of the country, if I may quote, let us work together to help Filipinos better understand the benefits of vaccines. In times of crisis, vaccines can spell the difference between life and death. And so with that, we urge our locators and their workers as our EcoZone frontliners to get their jobs 
as soon as possible. This is the faster way we can help contribute to fully reopening the economy and our transition to the new normal. Meantime, as we await for the rollout of vaccines, we ask everyone to take all precautions to protect ourselves and others and to never put our guard down by strictly complying with the COVID health and safety protocols. With that, maraming salamat sa ating lahat at mabuhay. Thank you very much, maraming salamat po. Elza, Deputy Director General for Policy and Planning, Mr. Tereso Opanga. Thank you so much for that enlightening key takeaways. So again, on behalf of PESA, I thank all our speakers from this morning, from the government side and the private sector. Thank you so much for all your questions for the audience who participated in Facebook and YouTube. We hope you continue to follow and subscribe in our platforms in social media. We hope PESA and our speakers were able to enlighten our online participants regarding this important matter on COVID-19 vaccine procurement. We fervently hope that you have all gained knowledge and have um, learned from this today's forum. So again, we would like to reiterate uh, uh, that the resource materials from our speakers are available by filling up the evaluation form for this online dialogue. A link will be flashed on your screen and it will be put in our social media platforms. And we are providing the contact details, not necessarily personal contact details, the uh, government or office uh, contact details of our speakers. So we have from the DDOH, from the National Task Force, from Go Negosho, from Red Cross and IP Biotech. You may directly contact them for audiences, for our PESA registered companies interested um, in being able to access the, their materials and being able to liaise with them directly. You may also copy furnish PESA in case you want to um, copy furnish PESA through info at PESA.gov.ph. Thank you so much to everyone. Um, the recording of this online dialogue will be available in our social media platform in PESA and on our YouTube. So don't worry, you may go back to this discussion again. Um, it's already lunchtime. Let's have a good lunch today. It's Tuesday and we had a very fruitful online dialogue. Please keep safe always and follow the health protocols in place and keep in mind that our, uh, the reminders are key takeaways from our resource speakers. Again, in behalf of PESA, thank you very much. Um, please continue to join us in our online dialogues. Thank you. Signing off your MC, Tassi Abdurra of PPRG. Hi, Roach. Thank you.